place that once was, an Eden, unique in its formation, it is a sea within a sea, an ocean garden that has 7,500 miles of shoreline, and 5,000 islands, and 36,000 miles of ocean. Rich in nutrients from over 60 rivers mixed by cold water currents and tremendous tides, it's home to over 100 species of fish, 18 species of marine mammals, and an abundance of birds. There is a place that teems with life and was once one of the world's greatest fisheries. It is these fisheries that lure the first European settlers and established early America. It is a wonder, and there is nothing like it anywhere else, the Gulf of Maine. As my girls were growing older, I wanted them to learn about the ocean and the people that made their living from the sea. So we embarked on a week-long sailing journey to learn about the Gulf of Maine and the health of its fisheries, and to interview people who were interested in preserving the marine life and traditions of the area. To help us with the filming and recording, we had Alex Torres and Nico Denan join us. Right off the bat, they taught Georgiana and Noel how to set up and use the various cameras and sound equipment. It was great to have such dedicated guys on board to help us get up to speed so quickly. Well, I'm hoping that we'll be able to put together, together a good story to educate different people about the fishing industry in Maine and how it's changed. Like hearing Colin talk today, it sounds like it's affected a lot of you know, Maine's history. These fertile waters of the Gulf enabled tremendous fishing stocks to grow, and no other fish was more significant or commercially important than cod. What happened to the codfish in the Gulf is a story for our time, of how technological advancement and consumption depleted a wild resource once thought to be inexhaustible. The big commercial thing always historically though was cod, yeah. because unlike all the other types of fish, Cod could be caught and dried and salted in the sunlight and would be cured uh, so it wouldn't perish and you could transport it across the ocean back in the 1600s or 1700s where there was no freezers and no refrigeration. It was very easy to preserve it. Unfortunately, some parts of the cod trade also played a role in the slave economy of the Caribbean. Here slaves were nourished to be more productive workers with the dried cod from New England. Monhegan is a small rocky island 10 miles off the coast of Maine. For centuries its location enabled its local fishermen to make their living from the sea. Based on generations of work in the local waters, the people of the island understand fishing and lobstering. We were lucky to be able to speak with what some people call the king of Monhegan, Sherm Stanley. Sherm is in his 80s and has a lifetime of experience working on the water as a fisherman. Contrary to the image many have of a crusty, laconic fisherman from Maine, I discovered Sherm to be very kind, generous with his time, and a wonderful storyteller. Wow. And it's, it's a good mm. dinner, let me tell you. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd sit down to a cutfish dinner any time, salt cod. But they like to have them out on flakes, and that yard out there, right here, that was uh, my grandfather's, and that was all flakes. Had big frames with chicken wire on them, up on horses, you know, I'm going to say probably this high off of the ground, so that you could walk around and, and tend them. early accounts you start reading that everyone thought were probably um, exaggerated of the early explorers coming to the Gulf of Maine were like our vessel we're approaching Nantucket uh, we hit a um, shoal of cod there were so many cod in the water that our sh it slowed down and stopped our ship from sailing forward I had a boat built through the spring and summer of 48 and my brother and I went down off, right off of the point here at what they call uh, lo a lobster cove point and uh, I could have sunk her with codfish from here to those boats right off here in the harbor. We could catch cod by simply lowering a basket over the ship's side and pulling up as many as we wanted. 
Now those were all thought as must have been exaggerations. The more they're starting to look and do the sort of forensics of digging in the past and reconstructing what the fish stocks were like, they might not have been exaggerating. Now a codfish is like this. Not only are there not very many around, we're catching just the babies. They never get to grow to be that big. The old bones they find of codfish from the 1600s, they were huge. They were the size of people. Our ability to catch fish and our technology to pinpoint them and catch every last fish in a school has become so good that we are in fact able to catch more fish than entire stretches of the ocean can reproduce. We're that good at it. And those innovations have been going on for a while. If you go back to the 1600s and early 1700s, when everyone was still using hand lines, they were going out in small boats and throwing a hook over the side and you'd have to bring the hook up like this and take the fish off and bait it and throw it down again and having to do it again and again. The dorymen who worked these deckless skiffs were a brave and rugged lot. They often perished battling the storms, fog, and freezing temperature of the North Atlantic. Well, the first big innovation was somebody came up with a plan where for certain fish, you could, you could do long lines. They would go out in their dories and they would have a line with hundreds of hooks on it, and you would bait each hook and deploy it over the side and string out these long lines and then you'd come back later and go to the other end and start pulling them up and taking the fish off. So the same people in, this, in a short period of time could catch, I don't know, 10, 20 times as many fish. That was probably in my line of thinking the hardest work I ever did because it was steady. You, you, you went, took a day to get bait, cut the bait, bait the gear, and then uh, if you could get it done in time, you'd go right out. I mean, sometimes you didn't sleep very much. That was, that was really hard work, I thought, long lining. And already there were protests. This innovation really took hold in the 19th century. There were protests at the time where fishermen said it, that this new technology was outstripping the ability of nature to reprovide and they were seeing collapses in fish stocks. By the time the next generation came around, long lines was the, was the, the norm and they were getting worried because um, steam engines uh, had been introduced into steamships and people had come up with the first ways to pull a net behind you and drag all the fish up. Instead of waiting for the fish to come to you, for the first time you would just chase down the fish. You would drag a net and just scoop them all up. And that was seen by the generation who grew up long lining and thought that normal. They protested that the, whatever was left of the fish stock after long lining was being decimated and destroyed by this new steam technology. Well then people invented diesel engines which were much more reliable than steam engines and instead of needing you know, a crew of a dozen people to run a steamship, two or three people could run it. They were more reliable, more efficient, and a smaller vessel with a smaller crew could go out even further. And they took that to a bigger and bigger extreme, started building larger and larger ones, larger and larger nets. People started having radar, things became safer, you could communicate with shore with radio eventually with cell phones and have GPS satellite systems that told you where you were. You started having fish finders attached to the nets so that you could see the nets of you ahead of it, of the fish that were coming. You started building onboard processing plants. The speed of technological innovation just ramped up and the potential killing power of the ships grew exponentially. by the 1970s had far outstripped the speed with which oceans can generally reproduce anything. And yet everyone knew that fish stocks were just collapsing from the pressure, but politically nobody could manage to do anything about it until fish stocks collapsed. They closed the fisheries after, you know, the, the barn door to the classic. All the horses were already gone.
Early in the morning, next to the Monhegan Pier and in the fog, we met Carl Wilson and Deirdre Gilbert from Maine's Department of Marine Resources. They are both highly knowledgeable and experts in their field, and I very much appreciated the time they spent talking to us. I think we were uh, surrounded by ghosts. You know, um, I think a lot of the uh, traditions on the coast, you know, you know, have narrowed down into lobsters. Um, and, uh, and that's real unfortunate. Uh, I just read a paper that's going to be coming out um, where some graduate students went back and mined old historical data records. And, um, for example, they found that fishermen in Frenchman's Bay, fishing out of day, you know, day boats, sailboats, landed more codfish out of Frenchman's Bay than are being landed in the entire Gulf of Maine in 1860. Some of the work we've done out here has found very small lobsters in very deep water that if there was an active ground fish population probably would have been fish food. Yeah, but they, they sure uh, uh, become depleted when the drag has come in, you know, and uh, dragged the bottom and destroyed the feeding bottom, in my, my line of thinking anyway, and uh, uh, they, they, they kill so many of the small fish. It goes all back in the cod end, you know, and a lot of it gets smothered. And uh, if it's in the winter time, it gets pretty chilled when they haul it on deck to cull it out, and take out what they want. The rest goes overboard in the summer, it cooks. Um, today, everyone's upset because we've wiped out cods so much that the number of cod that exist uh, in the ocean is in some places it's, there's 1% of what there was in 1965, say. I, it got to the point I had to, after the years go by, I'm running, you know, where I used to go 15 minutes, I'm running 45 minutes, then I'm running an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half to get on any piece of bottom where I can catch fish. So that tells you something, because you're not gonna go a long distance if you can catch them right in the harbor. So that's the way that sort of uh, petered out. I came away from our journey wondering about the health of our oceans. Yet the ocean presents something of a dilemma. Even though the surface of the ocean looks similar year after year, tremendous changes can be occurring below the surface. These changes can be subtle at first and difficult to detect. When it comes to fisheries, the changes can be dramatic. And if a species is depleted, recovery is extremely difficult. And in the case of the puffins, it takes decades to even begin to reestablish themselves. I hope a new ocean ethic develops that involves collaborative and community-based solutions where whole ecosystems are taken into consideration. I've always loved that the ocean appears vast, untamed, and free. Though I now realize the ocean's resiliency has limits, the ocean and the life within it are vulnerable and need our stewardship and protection more than ever.